Hey you, are you wasting your time on social media again? Your brothers and sisters in the Islam net from Norway are establishing a masjid, a dawah center. Establishing a masjid to convey the message of Islam is one of the best deeds a Muslim can do. There's a huge need for it in Norway. You know this and I know this. So that makes the reward even greater. So give generously and Allah Azza wa Jal will give you even more. Sheikh Muhammad Hijab are establishing Islam in the West. Sheikh Muhammad Hijab, Faliatafadal, Mashkuran, Majura. Takbir. 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 How for ten and ten? Takbir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? It's good to see you guys again. You know. We've been uh, fundraising for this mosque for many years on our YouTube channel. I'm not sure if any of you have seen the videos. And now I've prayed in it, you know, alhamdulillah. It's good to finally pray in the masjid that we've uh, collectively, mashallah, fundraised for. So well done to you, takbir. You guys have done it yourself. And inshallah, us, all of us, can get the rewards of every prayer, every wudu, and everything else that happens in this masjid. There's a lot going on now in the world, as you guys know. There's a lot going on now. And wallahi, one of the things that I think has been best about what's happened with the Palestine issue is that the masks of the opponents of Islam and the Muslim peoples have dropped. We really understand where we stand now vis-a-vis -vis these people. That now the indifference, the apathy that they feel towards us and our people is made clear. Subhanallah. What's happened in the last 120 days has been quite shocking. It's made all of us go through a tumultuous and tempestuous time from an emotional perspective. That's definitely the case. But it's also an opportunity for us. Because in this time, we've re-reminded ourselves of what the purpose of life is. We've reminded ourselves of the fact that we are Ummah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's created unification among the Muslim people. And it's allowed us to establish Islam to a certain extent in a way that wasn't established before. Because we realized, we realized that the ones who care most about us is us. This is what we realized. You know, there was, there was an ayah in the Quran, which is a very important ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَن تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ that len, it won't be the case that the Jews and the Christians will ever accept you fully except if you accept their own way, their way. And then Allah responds, He says that the true guidance is the guidance of God. That if you follow their way after what has come to you from knowledge, then you have no path to Allah and you have no protector against Him. So, what's interesting about this is the following. Human beings, psychologically speaking, human beings have an in-group, out-group bias. All of us are like that. We're in, We're tribal. We have a psychological disposition to a kind of tribalism. Now that tribalism can be on the basis of the color of your skin. It could be on the basis of the language that you speak. It could be on the basis of your religion or the religion of your ancestors. It could be any of those things or all of those things. That's how human beings are. And just like a true Christian believer will never accept us whilst we're still Muslim, a true liberal will never accept us until we absorb their liberalism. They will never accept us. It's the same thing with a true feminist or even a, even a true atheist. It's the case. It's just the way that we are wired. We identify with a certain label and we will never accept fully this person until they accept our worldview. Because the thing is, psychologically speaking, if you think about it, if this wasn't the case, then it inhibits our survival mechanisms. 
This is a survival function. It allows us to group together. It allows us to organize together. It's a very normal part of human life. However, the Quran, because it knows that human being has this proclivity and it has this bias, it says, وَإِذَا قُلْتُمْ فَأَعْدِلُوا وَإِنْ كَانَ ذَا قُرْبَى This is a very important part of an ayah. That if you speak, speak the truth, and even if the person is close to you, even if the person is close to you, because it's natural, you're going to have that bias to people who are closer to you, your family members. That be upright, standing with justice, even if it's against your own self. So the point the Quran is making is the following. The Quran is making the point that we understand human beings have an in-group, out-group bias, psychologically speaking. But what should take precedence above and beyond that is the truth and your quest for it. Which is why when Abraham was having a dialogue with his people, they said, we're going to follow what our forefathers were upon. قَالَ وَلَوْ جِئْتُكُمْ بِأَهْدَى مِمَّا وَجَدْتُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَبَاءَكُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّا بِمَا أُرْسِلْتُمْ بِهِ كَافِرُونَ He said, what if I bring you something which is better in guidance than what your forefathers have? They immediately said, what? We, are, we disbelieve in what you bring. فَانْتَقَمْنَا مِنْهُمْ And Allah destroyed them and the verses continue. What is really interesting is this. We in the West, Muslim people in the West, I'll be honest with you, we have had a problem. And the problem is, we don't know how to interact with the dominant population of liberals, of Christians, or whoever it may be. What's the, what's the right approach to take? Should we do the assimilation approach or the integration approach, where we just integrate, hold hand in hand and do whatever they want us to do? Or should we do the rejectionist approach, which is to deny everything they're saying and attack them on every point. I would like to posit to you that both of those approaches have shown to be failures if taken in their extreme form. If you're not somewhat pragmatic, you will be alienated and ostracized. And if you're not, and if you're too integrationist and assimilationist, then you become, you become effectively an Uncle Tom. As Malcolm X, and recently I was just going over his autobiography. Honestly, very powerful book. The autobiography of Malcolm X. And if you listen to, for example, the audio, audio book of that, it's very nice, the way the guy tells the story. And he, he talks about the same dynamics, the same exact dynamics in black America in the 1960s. The same thing. And he calls the people who want integration, he calls them integrationists. He gives them a term, the integrationists, the Uncle Toms. And for women, it's Aunt Jemima. I don't know why it's this, but... And he's exposing them, and he's doing this, and he's explaining everything. But it's the same, very same dynamics. Which is, if you go f too far in this direction, you become the impossible subject. And if you go too far in this direction, you just become assimilated. It's like if I bring you a fruit salad. Yes, a nice fruit salad, you see the banana... You see, you know, the grapes, you see the apple. But we are able to distinguish between each fruit. The Muslim is able, if you're in a basket of goods, you can distinguish. This is the Muslim, this is the non-Muslim. I don't know which one will be, the banana or this one or that one. <laughs> I don't know which fruit, maybe the grapes. A great one. Yeah? But there are some soup. The assimilation approach is, if, imagine, you know the soup. When they blend the, 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 the vegetables together, it just becomes some color, one color. You can't even differentiate between the Muslim and the non-Muslim. Islam doesn't want that. Islam definitely doesn't want that. The Islamic approach, in fact, a lot of the things, like for example, the uniform of Muslim people, when the Prophet ﷺ said, that trim the mustache and grow the beard and oppose the Jews and the Christians. It doesn't mean oppose them like trying to attack them or hurt them. We want to differentiate ourselves from the rest of the people. We want to stand out. We want to be different. The same thing with the hijab of the women. 
it's not just okay to protect the, the bodies and so on and molestation and all that kind of thing, which is there as well because فَلَا يُؤْذَيْنِ is in the Qur'an. But it's also to distinguish, it's a sign of distinguishment. This is a sign of differentiation. This is what we are. We belong to this tribe, the tribe, the mega tribe of the Muslim people. It's a way to, to show where we stand on the matter. Pause the video for a second. You thought I'd forget about you. When you're finished with the video, make sure you click the link below and put a donation for the masjid. So yes, the, the purely integration approach has shown to be a failure. And in fact, the worst thing about it is that it makes you like a slave. And do you know, let me tell you something. There are some people, and we all come from countries, a lot of us come from countries which were colonized by some Western country, mostly the United Kingdom, unfortunately, where I now reside. So I reverse the colonization, you see. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I know some right-wing guy is going to say, look what he said. <laughs> but a lot of these countries, well, like for many of you from Pakistan, put your hands up if you're from Pakistan. Okay, there you have a lot of you. It's colonized by, put your hands up if you're from uh, North Africa, somewhere from North Africa. Okay, put your hands up from Somalia. There's a lot of Somalis here, mashallah. And I'm not going to differentiate between Somalia and Somalia land and all these kind of things, okay? Or Hargesa and Mogadishu and this one and that one. The white man decided and you do the thing. Forget about all of this. Hargesa is a beautiful place and Mogadishu is a very beautiful place. Anyway, all of it is good. But what I'm saying is that we come, a lot of us come from pre-colonized countries, you see. And so there's different psychological reactions to that. Some people, they become servile. They say, okay, well, they're in this position. They must be better than us. So we have to try and copy them. And this is how you lose your dignity. When you try and copy unworthy per personnel. You're trying to copy someone who doesn't show you why they should be copied. Why? Because they have tall buildings and clean streets. It's not really a reason why you should copy someone, to be honest with you. Most of our countries need a bit of cleaning up. That's true. <laughs> If you've been to Cairo, I'm, I'm from Alexandria in Egypt, that place needs a good scrub down. <laughs> that needs to be yani, cleaned up. But that's not a good reason to copy someone else. Carl Jung, one of the great psychologists of the 20th century, said, the, the West are technological giants and moral midgets. They're moral midgets. So if I was going to copy them in something, I would copy them in the technology. Fine, that you've given me a good reason to copy you in technology. If, I wanna, if I'm going to start a manufacturing industry, an automobile industry, I say, let's see how the Germans done it. Let's see, how, let's see how the Germans done it, because they've got fantastic cars. No problem. I don't see any... It's not undignified. No problem. If you want to start, I don't know, like... Or maybe the Japanese, because the Japanese are doing very well. Even the Americans, they've got good, they've got good cars. In the 80s and 70s, they had these very beautiful... Because I don't know where they are now, not as good as before. But it's fine. If you want to do some scientific experiment, let's say, okay, fine, let's see how these guys do it here. Let's get, no problem. But when it comes to morality, which is what is right and what is wrong, now you're saying, let's follow them. Why? You might not say, okay, let's follow them. You might not say it like that. But it, the ideas will come into your mind. You will say to yourself, for example, you'll say to yourself, let's be a bit more progressive. You see this word progressive, because the, the word progressive could mean progressive in terms of technology, but it could also mean progressive in terms of morality. And what they've done is they've equivocated it. They put both of them together. So when you say progressive, it's like all in one basket, but we all know it's not all in one basket. We all know it's not all in one basket. So some of us have this servile attitude when it comes to following the West. And you need to understand that this is to your own detriment and to my own detriment. There are some animals in the animal kingdom which you can tell are prey even if you didn't see them devoured by any predator. And there are some animals that you would know they're predators even if you did not see them pounce on any prey. If you saw a lion walking around, if you went to the zoo one time, I went to the zoo, my children, and I saw a tiger come out of this place. The tiger, the way it was walking around, was like he owned the place. It's walking around like this. I had to, I, I, I was, 
I was thinking, okay, you're in control. <laughs> There's a boss here and it's not, it's not me, it's this guy. <laughs> it's true, because it's the way it was what he knew. He knew where he stood. The lion, even when the lion is tired, he still shows dominance. He shows, sorry to say, superiority. If you look at the eagle, have you seen the way the eagle compared to other birds? Now, I'm not teaching anyone here to be arrogant. <laughs> I've been accused of it myself. But I'd rather appear arrogant than weak, although both are bad. But I'm saying that the eagle, you see, it's, it knows its capabilities. Each animal knows its capabilities. Do you want to be like an eagle or a lion or a tiger or a cheetah? Or do you want to be, sorry to say, like a sheep or rabbit? Or a squirrel. <laughs> or a squirrel. Say like a rat. <laughs> you don't even need to say anything or do anything. Whether you behave like a predator or a prey, it's not even in the arguments that you make. Some people say, well, it's easy for you to say you've been studying this stuff all your life. I say it's nothing to do with what I've studied. Attitudes eat arguments for breakfast. They do. It's about your, de your demeanor. It's about your attitude. If your attitude is, look, I'm right. We are right when it comes to deen. You have to start acting like you're right. That's the, that's the first step towards establishing ourselves in the ummah. We have to start acting to people like we're right and they're wrong. أَفَنَجْعَلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ كَالْمُجْرِمِينَ مَالُكُمْ كَيْفَ تَحْكُمُونَ Should we make the Muslims like the rebellious ones? How is it how you judge? When it comes to, okay, science and technology, we give it to you for the last hundred years. We can make all the excuses we want, but we have not been performing very well. As the Muslim, collectively, we have not been very good. That's the truth. Bottom line. It's, that doesn't... Speak of the golden age of Islam, or this, and the Ottomans, and the Abbasids, and the Umawis, and Andalusia, and this one, and that one, and Timbuktu, and that. I'm not mentioning any of that stuff. We know we have a good history. But for the last hundred years, it's not been fantastic. But the problem is, when we're asked about Palestine, we're asked about this, or that, it's about how we respond. You see, it's not like that. But you say, no, 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 but this, and that, we're like you. No, no, please, you know. It's like, uh, but if you were asked the question, it's a different, even if what I'm saying is false, 2 plus 2 equals 5. <laughs> no, but it's about how you hold yourself. I was having an argument with my daughter one time, because sometimes I do debates with them. She's a 10 year old. And subhanAllah, Allah always sends me someone to humble me, yeah? <laughs> Because I, I just done this, um, this debate in South Africa, uh, and I was feeling good about it. It was all right, and some that people were outside. There was a lot of people in South Africa, and I was saying, yeah, there's the people. Anyway, and then when I went back to the United Kingdom and stuff like that, I spoke to my son and my daughter, and I started, I wanted to debate anyone. Because you know when you feel like you want to debate. So I saw them talking about Peppa Pig. I don't know if you guys know about this, if you have it in Norwegian. And I got into a debate with my son and daughter about Peppa Pig. I said, uh, the, the, the whole debate was, is it 2D or is it 3D? And I was saying, it's 3D. It's a 3D cartoon. Every cartoon is 3D and all this kind of stuff. My son said, no, it's not. It's not 2D. It's, not 3D. it's 2D. It's 100% 2D. And we know it's 2D because we went online and we checked it and it's a 2D animation. I said, you don't know what you're talking about. You're seven years old. <laughs> and I, I was speaking with such confidence and they were both vehemently against me for 20 minutes. I said, if you don't know what you're talking about, and blah, 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 and the confidence, the confidence. And then finally, they said, okay, it's 3D. I said, there's only one way to find out. So we went online and checked it, and it turned out to be 2D. <laughs> so I was totally wrong, yeah? And whatever confidence you want to try and bring to the table, it says 2D there, and it's 2D, right? But my daughter said something to me, which was very powerful, and I remember it. She said, it's not about what you were saying, it's how you were saying it. 
You seem so confident that what you are saying is true that you made me doubt myself, even though for many years I was watching this thing and it said 2D animation next to it, and I was totally sure it was 2D. By the way, don't watch Peppa Pig. This is a horrible show. <laughs> I realized with my kids, you know, my, Peppa Pig, there's a, the Baba Pig or Father Pig, or whatever his name is, he's always humiliated. He's always humiliated. Have you noticed? He's always humiliated. And I, I noticed that one time, one of my daughters, she said to me, Silly Baba. I said to her, what did you say? She goes, silly, because that's what, that's what the pepper does to the father. Always tries to humiliate him. That's what they do with uh, men nowadays in some of these things. And uh, so I went online, I started researching, and I realized it was a feminist, uh, it was a feminist cartoon. <laughs> well, at least it was like some, some slow burning feminism there or something. But anyway, Peppa Pig to the side for now, because I can refute him in my own time. I'll make a series, The Refutation of Peppa Pig. I'll do a PDF with him <laughs> on Peppa Pig and Daddy Pig. But the point is, that I was trying to make, is it's about how you come across. Hold on for a second. You still want those incredible rewards, right? So make sure you click the link below and you donate for the Mega Masjid Project. I'll give you another story. It's a true story. I was once in a debate scenario. I made this video. And this video was um, about the fine-tuning of, uh, of the universe and how everything is perfectly and all this kind of stuff. And it w went viral. It was my first viral video. It got a million views. I was shocked. I was very surprised. I said, wow, one million views. Fantastic. Now that's just like, you know, nothing. Water off a duck's back. No, I'm, 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 only, I'm only joking. It was it's still, you know, one of the seminal moments. It was in Speaker's Corner. And then one guy from Munich University, with one of these kind of German universities, he came to me, he said to me, you said, this is the probability, I don't know anything about, I mean, I shouldn't be admitting this because someone's going to take advantage, but my math skills are not all there, right? I mean, I've done my GCSEs, like, you know, the high school stuff in, in England. But he said, you said this, but that's total probability, it's not Bayes' theory. So I said, not really. So he said, if you do Bayes' theory, if you put the same numbers, this is, this is your, this is the uh, results. And he, he gave me the results. So this is what I done. I said, really? I said, okay. I started making as if I know what I was talking about. It's like I'm reading Chinese, yeah? I didn't know anything. It's like Norwegian. <laughs> mm. I looked at him, looked back at him, looked at him. I said, are you sure about these numbers? <laughs> <laughs> he said to me, um, yes, I'm sure about these numbers. And then he started showing off about his qualifications. He said, I've been a professor for this many years. I said, I know you've been a professor and I respect your knowledge, but I have one question, one question. Are you sure <laughs> about these numbers? He said, he looked at it now, he's, the doubt was starting to come in him. <laughs> he, said, he looked at it and then he put it back. He goes, um, yes, I am sure. So I took it back. I said, I started doing this, look. <laughs> And then I started grinning to make it look like I knew something he didn't. <laughs> I said to him, are you sure about these numbers? He said, yes, I am. I said, listen, we all know to be sure about these numbers. I'll give you another chance to look at them in your own time when you're having tea. I'm going to look at them as well, and we'll speak about it afterwards. He said, uh, all right, whatever. I said, look, someone's calling me. I need to leave now. <laughs> Anyway, I ran to a friend of mine, <laughs> mathematician. I said, look, take a look at this thing. Tell me what he's saying. So two of them came, actually two Somalis. <laughs> Mashallah. Were, one of them, he said, he made a mistake here. So as soon as he said he made a mistake, I started running. <laughs> I said, are you sure about this, brother? And then he gave it to his friend, his other Somali friend. I said, you look at it independently. He looked at it and he said, yes, he made a mistake. So I said to him, Labadina Fi'an. I said, both of you are very good. I had to say it to him in Somali just to put the point across. So you're fantastic. So I went back to him now. <laughs> and talk about, I was just waiting for him to come. I said, look. So we're having a conversation about the numbers, right? I said to him, you really made a mistake, didn't you? <laughs> and then I started, uh, <laughs> I started, I started becoming a superior guy, like, I said to him, this is the problem with atheism. <laughs> I said, you, 
You know the Quran says, "In yadunu illa dhannan." That they only, they only have guesses and they don't have any true faith. Which is true, by the way. Thank you, brother. Just make sure it doesn't drop. You don't need... Yeah. Norwegian water. Fantastic. You have to be honest, isn't it? You have to give, you have to give the white man his dues here. <laughs> ah. But I was in the hotel room and there, there wasn't any water in the thing. I said, let me just drink from the... From the toilet one, you know? It was so clean and pure. <laughs> I, w- I said, I'm going to just turn the tap on. Not the, not the bowl. <laughs> I'm not talking about the bowl here. I'm talking about, you know, the sink. But I didn't do it. Because even I felt a little bit embarrassed to do something like that. But I didn't feel embarrassed to take this guy. I said to him, this is the bowl. And then I started to take him to my area, which is philosophy and stuff like that. And then we, we finished on an amicable note. The point is, it's the way you come across. This is the number one tip that you must take. If you take this tip, everything else will change in your life. But just don't implement it in your home. Because I tried it with my wife. I said, yeah, so, uh, polygamy. And, and as soon as I said it, in, whatever confidence you said, she said, polygamy. I said, no, no, no. I said, uh, what did you say? I said, I didn't, I didn't say anything. <laughs> then I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> Did you hear me say that? She goes, yeah, yeah, how'd you say that? She goes, don't even think about it. I said, that. I said no problem. <laughs> and I had to hang my... But the point is, is that you can't win in an argument with your wife. Because if you beat her, you lose. I've tried it a few times, and I, I was definitely successful. Like, on a content level. <laughs> wallahi, wallahi, if someone was marking it, there's no doubt I won this argument. I, I got her in every point, And she just stayed quiet. I said, can I have tea now? I said, can I have tea? <laughs> it's finished now, bro. You can't, it's a lose-lose situation. So confidence needs to be put in the right places. Don't use it with your... Don't try this at home, effectively. But that's the first thing. The Prophet ﷺ told us. He told us, Sharaf al-Ummah, the dignity of the Ummah, is qiyamuhum bil-layl. Is doing qiyamu layl Wa'izzuhum istighna'uhum anin nas. And the true might and dignity of the believer is when they are sufficient from the people. When we don't need to grovel on our hands and knees to the dominant population. We don't need to do that. Not in posture and not in position. We don't need to do that. That is the first step. Because the question is, how do we establish ourselves as a community? The answer is, we have to establish a kind of humble superiority. We're not saying we're better than you as people, but we're saying that at least on the issue of morality, we have the answers and you don't have the answers. And in fact, I was just reading before I came. I was reading a very powerful study that was conducted actually in the University of Mannheim in Germany. We're talking about Germany today so much. But this study was interesting because they wanted to see the impact of believing in oneness on life satisfaction. This is the first study of its kind I've ever seen. And they looked at different religious communities. They looked at Jews, they looked at Christians, they looked at Hindus, they looked at everyone. And in fact, they had three criterion for establishing life satisfaction. One of them is social connectedness. The other one is connection to nature. And the third one was empathy. Yes, these are three criterion. And their conclusions was that Muslim people had the highest life satisfaction of all the groups tested. And the reason they claim, and they're not Muslims, the woman's name was Laura um, Mary, Mary Laura or Laura Mary, I can't remember the name of the person, and another person as well. There were two of them that were heading this uh, study. They, re- they said the reason why they have higher life satisfaction was because of their belief in oneness. Their beliefs in oneness. So the question is, if the dominant population is correct about their world life view, world view and world v- the ideology, then why is it that they weren't scored number one in this study, for example? And this is not just one study in isolation. A lot of studies point to the same kind of direction. So, for example, Pew Research in 2019, 
they uncovered that religious observers, generally speaking, have a better life satisfaction, have better life satisfaction than non-religious people. This is the only study that I've just mentioned, the one in 2020 or 2021, which is the, uh, I think it's called the impact of oneness in belief or, and life satisfaction. That's the name of the study, something to that effect. That specified Muslim people. I see you didn't get bored by the champ. Ha, huh? I like that. But make sure you click the link below and donate to the Mega Message Project I mentioned. So we have actually more than one study that examined many participants across the world, which indicate that if you believe in one thing, if you believe in one entity and you have Tawhidic beliefs, monotheism, that you are more likely to have satisfaction in life. Now someone could argue, well, if that's the case, some, I'm just giving you a, a counter argument, if that's the case, why is it that the happy index, because there's something called in, in economics, the happy index, the happy index seems to favor, because if you go Google now, the happiest uh, countries in the world, you'll see Scandinavia up on the top, even though we know that the suicide rate is very high and that depression is extremely high in this country. And I've even done a social experiment, if you remember, if I had me and you walked the streets and asked the people, they didn't seem as if they were having a good time or that they were satisfied. And we even tried it in Sweden. We've done the same thing in Sweden. The reason is because the happy index, it pre-assumes that, look, if you make more money, that means you're happy. So the, it's not, not showing you, it's not asking these people, for example, the happy index, it's not asking these people, are you happy? And then tell it from a scale of 0 to 10, how happy are you? And then it's collating that data, for example. It's not doing that. It's just saying they have more money, which is likely means that they, they have more satisfaction. In, if someone uses this as an argument, it becomes a circular argument, because the whole point is we're trying to say that happiness doesn't come from money. That's the whole point. We're trying to make the point that happiness doesn't come from money. So someone responds and says the happy index shows that Norway and Sweden and these are happy, happiest countries and Copenhagen is the best city to live in, or all these kinds of things from The Economist. We'll say that's a circular kind of reasoning. So it's not the case. And happiness and satisfaction are two different things anyway. Happiness is an elevated state. It can even be... Uh, analyze dopaminergically, like your dopamine spikes and stuff, and being happy all the time is not a good thing to be. Because if you're very happy and ecstatic all the time, you're likely to plunge into a lower state of depression. That's why Allah says in the Quran, Allah bi zikrillahi tatuma'innul qulub. That certainly with the remembrance of God, do hearts find rest, tatuma'innul qulub. It doesn't say tas'adul qulub or tafrahul qulub. It doesn't say it makes the hearts happy. There's a difference here. Because having a state of contentment and satisfaction is more longevous, it's more long-lasting, it's, it's actually more preferred. If there was one state that if you had to press a button today, that you would be like that for the rest of your life, it wouldn't be happiness. Because that would create disturbance, psychological disturbance. It would be tamatnina. It would be satisfaction. It would be this feeling of achievement. It would be this feeling of tranquility, peace. That's the feeling that if you could press a button and that if you could feel, that would be good to feel that feeling. Now that's what Islam promotes. I was speaking to Jordan Peterson. Now, unfortunately, he sold himself, I have to say. As you guys know, I don't know if you've seen the tweet. Have you seen what he's been doing? Anyway, we gave him dawah and his people dawah, but there was one thing in that discussion. He came to the mosque in England, and there was one interesting point of it. I said to him this thing. I said to him, look, our religion says, that whoever swerves away from my remembrance, you will have a miserable and depressed life. You will have a miserable and depressed life and we will gather them on the day of judgment blind. That's what Allah says in the Quran. That's what Allah says in the Quran about those who don't believe in Allah. I said to him, look, you can have a purpose in life. But if that purpose is not to worship one God, that Tawhidic belief, if it's not that purpose, you're always going to end up depressed. I said something to him like that. He said to me, well, it makes sense, and he always does this thing with his fingers like this. I don't know why he does that. 
like he's playing the, the invisible piano. <laughs> he said, yes, because if you're, he says, if your focus is multiplicitous, meaning if you're, if you're directing your focus to more than one place like this, you will create anxiety. But if it's only to one unifying cause or one unifying belief, which is for us Allah, the one that created everything, the all-knowing, the all-powerful, the one that created us and the one who's sustaining and maintaining us, one God, we focus all of our energies to Allah. And we say, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله, That there's no strength and power except with Allah. So it's one thing, then it creates tamatnina, that thing that we talked about, which is peace and tranquility. And there's no other way to establish this. And there's no other religion that can give you this. Because all the other religions in the world have some kind of hidden polytheism. Or not even hidden, sometimes it can be quite flagrant and obvious. The religions which don't, um, are less like that are like Judaism. And you know, in this whole Palestine conflict, I want to say this to you guys. We haven't spoken about this enough. And I'll tell you why. We haven't spoken about Jewishness and Judaism enough. And the reason why is because we've been afraid to be called anti-Semitic. But today after I drink this cup of water, everything's going to change. <laughs> I know there's some, some guy from the secret services here <laughs> saying, okay, now... What's a, what's a famous like a Norwegian name? Give me a name. Give me, give me one. Lars. <laughs> yeah, I, but there's been enough Larses I've had to deal with in my life. So Lars, you've got him now. He said he's going to be anti-Semitic. I don't know why he's got this kind of accent anyway, but I can't do the Norwegian accent. It's very difficult to do. If I tried to do it, it would probably sound like a German. <laughs> anyway. Islam deals with Judaism as a religion, and there's lots of ayat. And this is actually, I know this is going to go online, this is my message to the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> and you know we're coming for you, no, I'm only joking. <laughs> I'm only kidding, I'm only kidding. No, on a serious level, because Judaism is seen as two things at once. It's seen as it's an ethnicity and it's seen as a religion. So I'm not talking about the ethnicity. Although that has some bearing of what I'm about to say. One of the main things about Judaism as a religion is that they do believe that this group of people, this tribe of people, are the chosen people. They believe in that. And the Quran challenges this all the time. If you truly believe, if you truly believe that you are the chosen people, and it's mentioned twice, by the way, one in Surah Baqarah and the other one is in Surah Jumu'ah, chapter 62 of the Quran. If you really believe you are the favored people that Allah has chosen, then go ahead and ask for death. Now you might think, why is Allah saying this? Because if you are the favored person, and there is some level of afterlife, which they believe, although they don't spell it out. By the way, Jewish people don't have heaven and hell. This might be very surprising to you. Like yani, they might have some level of conception of the afterlife, but they don't have, Judaism doesn't have, like in Christianity and Islam, heaven and hell, it doesn't have this. SubhanAllah, by the way, interesting. Which is why the Quran, it actually uh, criticizes this. وَلَا تَجِدَنَّا How's it go? وَتَجَدَنَّهُمْ Aha. Well, I said, you don't know how much I'm going to Obviously, Somali, mashallah. You're from the Duxies, I've been helping you out, Akhi. Well, I said, you don't know how much I'm going to say, Hayatin. Well, I'm going to say, Ashraku. And this is Allah saying this about Jews and, and uh, polytheists. You'll find them the most cautious about preserving their life. Yani, sorry to say, Yani. Allah saying this, Quran. Well, I'm going to say, Yawadu Ahaduhum. لو يعمر ألف سنة وما هو بمزح زحه من العذاب أي عمر؟ correct yeah؟ إن شاء الله. ما أستاذ هذا سمالي. is saying that they wish to live a thousand years and he cannot live a thousand years. 
And he's not going to be able to swerve the punishment if he lives for a thousand years. That's what Allah says in the Quran. So, you, I've, I find this very interesting because I've been attacked on this basis. I had this debate with this guy called Unholy Shmoli. <laughs> and he was saying, like, you guys want to die, you want to die. It's, yani, I don't see why this is a criticism. We believe in an afterlife. Yes, we believe in Jannah. In fact, you should want to die. Calm down. Calm down, calm down. It's just a break. I'm reminding you that when you are finished watching the video, huh? that you click the link below and donate now. That, that Allah is saying, effectively, if you believe, if you believe you're the chosen one, you don't really need to do much. You're a chosen one. By accident of birth, you're the chosen guy. You're the one. Allah, you're so special, Allah chose you. Do you really believe this? And why are you, why are you here in this dunya? Outside in the minus 20 degrees and this one and that one. And why are you living this life? There must be something better waiting for you. If I truly believe this, I'd, every day I'd say, let me die, let me die, let me die. I'd even be going around the highways like this. <laughs> because the thing is, why am I this? The dunya is ikhtibar, is test, is pain, is things. If you, Allah is saying, if you really believe this about yourself, and you really believed in some level of an afterlife, then you should want death. But then Allah says something else. There's two verses. They don't and they won't ever ask for that. Because of what their hands have put forward. That's what Allah says. They know they're not going to ask for that. So yes, the Quran does speak to the Jews directly. It speaks to the Bani Israel. It says, there was a time. Ya Bani Israel, التي أنعمت عليكم ما أني فضلتكم على العالمين. واتقوا يوما لا تجزي نفس عن نفس شيئا ولا يخبل منها عدل ولا يؤخذ منها شفاعة ولا هم ينصرون. For example, that, that, يعني, you were chosen at one point in time. You were chosen. When you chose Allah, that's when you were chosen. This is not the Quran, this is me يعني, making a distinction. People are chosen on the basis of them choosing Allah. فَلَمَّا زَاهُوا أَزَاقَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ When they swerved, Allah swerved their hearts. You are chosen in as much as you choose Allah. You are chosen. And you can still be chosen. And this is my message to Jews. You can still be chosen. The, the Quran is giving you, is extending the olive branch to every Jew in the world. You can be part of this community. Yes. You can be. This is what Allah, He's telling us in the Quran. That there's something more. But then the question is, if your belief is one which is encourages preservation of life at all costs, and our religion is not that like that, and yes, preservation of life is, more, is important, but preservation of religion is more important, and there's a concept of martyrdom, then I would consider that to be an advantage, frankly. Because as Robert Greene said, the one who's willing to commit suicide has the initiative. Now, I'm not saying commit suicide, anyone. This how I got him here. I'm not talking about suicide mission here, bro. I'm just saying figuratively, the one who's willing to take it further. Why did Abu Bakr Siddiq, why was he Abu Bakr Siddiq? Because no one was willing to do more than him. He was willing to sacrifice every single thing. And the beautiful thing about the Palestine issue, Yahi, Ikhwa and Akhawat, is... The beautiful thing is that we're starting to see some of this again. We're seeing the resolve and the patience and the perseverance and the power of the Palestinian people. That these are a people who, who look like their mindset is that they don't mind to die and be martyrs. That they're preparing their whole family for that. That they're writing the names of the family on the feet of the children, subhanAllah. Imagine what kind of strength, mental strengths that take. How far away are we from that? How, and going back to the study, one of the things that this person said about how oneness affects life uh, situations, they said that because it encourages optimism. In calamities. Because Islam has a perpetual optimistic system. In whatever situation you're in, there's always good in it. It's always backed by the hikmah of Allah. So the point I'm making to you is, the most valuable thing that we have is the religion of Islam. If we imbue it in ourselves and manifest it to the public, we act as if, we act as if, and we should act like that, we have everything we need. 
that we have the thing to offer. You always know, you can, you can always know who's in control of a conversation. Even if you don't hear a word, just by the body language. Like, sorry to say, but if, if you guys went outside, yeah, and I'm going to make, keep giving these analogies, we talk about the presence and the play, pray, but it's another analogy. If you went outside and someone started asking you for money, it's an extreme example. But if someone was to see this, they would know, okay, this person has the upper hand and this person has the lower hand. They don't even need to see what you're saying to him or what, you're say, what she's saying to you or he's saying to you. You don't need to see any of that. We have to start acting as if we have the upper hand because we do. وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ الْعُلْيَةِ As the Quran says, that the word of Allah, it's high. And the Prophet told us, الْيَدُ الْعُلْيَةِ خَيْرٌ مِنَ الْيَدِ السُفْلَةِ That the upper hand is better than the lower hand. The Prophet told us that. So it's the attitude, number one is the attitude. It has to change radically. If we're interacting with a colleague or a friend, it doesn't mean be arrogant or belligerent. Allah says, وَلَا تَمْشُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا إِنَّكَ لَن تَخْرِقَ الْأَرْضَ وَلَن تَبَلُغَ الْجِبَالَ طُولَ Do not work, walk in the earth arrogantly. You're not going to pierce the earth and you're not going to reach the mountain and heights. There's a difference between walking with self-confidence and izza and self-dignity and walking with arrogance. But what is off the table is walking with weakness and defeat. Defeatism can never and will never produce what, we, what it needs to produce for us. So the first thing, if just this thing, number one, the attitude change, the mindset change was different and changed, you will already see radical results. Everyone, you'll start to see them tilting their hats towards you. The qubba, they'll start doing this to you, you'll see. Because people give you as much respect as you, as you demand. That's a principle, to be honest with you. It's an absolute principle. People give you as much respect as you demand. And as a community, we need to start demanding more respect. And that means we can't be always afraid of the consequences. So the attitude shift. And that means you're having tawakkul ala Allah. The reason why the Salaf, the early generations, were so successful in spreading Islam across the world was because they had this immense amount of courage backed by this immense amount of tawakkul, which means reliance on Allah. You realize that, look, I'm doing this for the sake of Allah, and it is what it is. Whatever happens, happens. If that mindset changes, everything changes. Second thing is organize. And now we have places like Islamnet, MashaAllah, which is very, very good. I'm very impressed with what they're doing, which is why I'm a, a frequent backer of Islamnet. Because I've seen the development of Islamnet for the last five to ten years. And subhanAllah, they've done fantastic work. This place, this whole place has become a masjid. We've been asking and they've expanded it. They put this room in the gym and all these kind of things. And now they're getting another masjid and another masjid. And awqaf and these kinds of things. There are buildings where they're renting out. And then it's going to say, Wallahi, this is exactly what the Muslim community has to do. This is exactly what it has to do. And the people are putting into a pot. And it's becoming, and they have big plans which we can't speak about because the enemy will take advantage. <laughs> they do have. But what I'm saying is that this is the second stage. So the first stage is what? An attitude change. Where you stop caring too much about what other people think. Don't worry too much about these guys. They don't care. Make them worry about what you think. You need to stop thinking about the consequences and becoming consequences. We need to become the consequence. The Muslim community have to become the consequence. Make them think, okay, well, if we mess around with this community, what's going to happen? We've seen what happened with the Zionist lobby. No one wants to say anything. Because they're afraid, okay, well, this, this thing is going to get cancelled. That one's going to get cancelled. I might get fired. I might get this. I might get cancelled. All that stuff. We need to start positioning ourselves in a, in, a, in a place where they say the same thing about the Muslim community. If we cross them like this, no, no, these guys are not messing about. They'll do this and they'll do that and they know how to do this. Men amin al aqubata asa al adab. Whoever doesn't fear the consequences is going to be belligerent. If, you don't, if we don't have collective consequences as a community, we are going to, we're going to become the prey. That's what's going to happen. So number one is an attitude change. Number two is mobilize and unify into organizations like this and everyone has to fund it. MashaAllah, how this place has worked out. But to be honest, we have a long way to go, to be honest with you. Our numbers are massive. There's 50 million Muslims in Europe. 
There's more Muslims in Europe than there are in some Muslim majority countries. If all the Muslims in Europe were one country, it would be one of the biggest Muslim countries in the world. That's the truth. If all the Muslims in Europe were one country, it would be in the top 10 or top 15 biggest Muslim countries in the world. It would be a big country. We're a big people. So that means we need to start acting like it. And by the way, it's not just that we're 50 million in Europe and all these kind of things, but it's that we have more money and we have more financial, educational, because of colonial reasons. Okay? We have all of these opportunities more so than the rest of the world. Like the 50 million in Europe, for example, and God knows how many in the West in general, I haven't checked, but that could be more than, let's say, 200 million in Pakistan or 120 million in Egypt or uh, that many people in 80 million in, in Turkey, the big Muslim country, or that many people in Indonesia, 300 million. It could be more. It could, could be that our collective power is 50 million, financially and otherwise, is more. So we need to start punching our weight, effectively. We need to start doing that. MashaAllah, you're still here. Just make sure that you donate by clicking the link below because the rewards are unimaginable. The third thing is, so we said number one was what? The attitude has to change. It really has to change. And what does it have to change to? To a more dignified attitude. Call it what you want to call it. We need to have confidence. Effectively, that's the main thing. We need to have superior confidence, which means we have to change as individuals. And number two, we have to what? We have to mobilize or organize or unite. Fine. Which means, by the way, when we find this, it's very unusual, Akhi. We find groups of people attacking each other, Muslim people, attacking each other on the basis of creed and this and that. That's fine, we can have these discussions. Allah is above the throne, is there, everywhere, wherever. We don't believe it's everywhere, of course, and all that kind of thing, but I'm just saying that these conversations cannot take center stage, they can't. Let me put it this way for you guys. Imagine you're about to attack a community. Let's say the Zionist community or something, yeah? Or not you, let's say another group was about to attack the Jewish community. <laughs> Some other group was about to attack them. And you saw two or three rabbis punching each other up. And you say, why are you, why are you doing this? And he says, because he says the Sabbath this and that one says Sabbath that. You will look at your friend and say, look at these people, man. Whilst we're plundering their lands and this and that, they're talking about the Sabbath. It's a trick of the shaitan, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. You can have these discussions all you like, but it has to be in the settings. At the end of the day, if we create this monster out of disunity, we will be eaten up. It's clear a strategy, divide and conquer. It's always, always a strategy. And they're funding it. For example, the Madkhali movement. Being funded by these guys. By the Americans, they're writing, we need these guys to talk about this and then following the Salaf. Following the Salaf is not mean yani, being a slave to a ruler somewhere in some other country which has got nothing to do with me. And the stuff that came out with, Akhi, there was one guy, his name was Rais. You can check this online. And I'm sorry if there's children here to say this. He's a Madkhali, yeah? In the Arab world, there's Madkhalis in the Arab world. He said, listen, he got overexcited. He said, if the ruler comes out and you see him committing zina, for half an hour, you cannot say a word about him. So this guy has this whole fantasy, sorry to say, and he said it to the people. So the people responded to him. So why did he have to say half an hour? <laughs> sorry to say, Annie. And number two, one sheikh came out, and I was quite impressed by this guy in the Arab world, big sheikh, and he was a Salafi. He said, this is false what they said because Surely, if everyone saw him, he should get the had. He should get the punishment. There's four, more than four witnesses. What's wrong? Why, why are you not punishing him? But the things that they say is so comical and so ridiculous and ludicrous that we know someone's paid you to say that. And the funny thing is, you know, Ajib, Ajib, Al Jazal Min Jinsil Amal. You do that to run away from the prison. Guess where he is now? He's in the prison, Akhi. <laughs> that guy himself who said that. Some country put him in a prison, Akhi. <laughs> And he was the one attacking all these mashayikh in the prisons and that. They put him in prison. al jazaa min jins al-amal. Kama tudinu tudan. You get what you, re you reap what you sow. 
The point is, is that these elements that try and create disunity are clearly either paid or they're aided by our enemies. The ones who really want to see us destroyed. We look at Lawrence of Arabia, for example, this, I'm not sure if you guys have known, but like in the ending of the Ottoman Empire and how he got the Arabs and the Turks to fight each other based on tribal and racial things. And we say, this, they're so stupid, look at the Arabs, they're, they're nationalists and the Turks, they became nationalists, it's so stupid. And we now are suffering from a very similar thing. We are. We have to be able to see the macro picture here. And the macro picture is, this is a game that's being played. And you've got to give it to them, they're playing it quite well. You, you, you have to give it to them. They, they know what they're doing with this thing. Propaganda, this one, they put some tribal chief, you give them money, just let them speak, say a few words, get these other guys, they know what they're doing, Achi. It's, the, it's a very simple strategy, but the way they do the strategy, it comes in different forms. And you have to be careful of that, because that's the only way you're going to keep down a sleeping giant. You have to break him up. We, as the Muslim Ummah, are a sleeping giant. So many millions of people across the world. So we have to unify. And yes, unity is different to uniformity. Unity means, okay, we'll come together on these common issues. Political issues, military issues, whatever issues. Uniformity means we all have to believe in the same thing. I'm not saying we all have to believe in the same thing. There's all, if you've got to get 2 billion people, or whatever it is, million uh, Muslims, hundreds of millions of Muslims, 2 billion Muslims, you're going to have disagreements. So we need to have mechanisms of how to manage those disagreements on the Ummah. And if we don't have those, we'll fail. The third thing we need to do, so number one is the attitude change. Number two, we said what was what? Unification, right? You guys with me or what? <laughs> number three is consistency. It's really as simple as that. Because we could, now we're in a situation, like with the Palestine issue, you might feel very motivated to do something. But six months from now, or a year from now, when this all has subsided, all of the demons of the past come up. And we're incapable of keeping to a plan and a routine. So we need to be able to keep to a plan and a routine ourselves, and our communities must be able to keep to a plan and routine. Which means there have to be systems and processes in place for the whole community, and contracts, that this is how we're going to do it. And I'm not telling you how to do it, you're going to find your own ways to do this. But that is, these are the three steps to success in the Ummah. With that, I will conclude. Jazakumullah khairan. Guys, I feel like I'm part of the family. I feel like, you know, here in Oslo is like a second home now. The amount of time I've spoken about this message in the center of my videos and stuff like that. And how I've seen it grow and develop and this organization grow and develop. I'm sure all of you guys are going to back this organization. It's the biggest in your country. And it's the most important, in my opinion, in your country as well. So backing it is an easy way through funding, through sharing, through liking, through all these different ways, this organization. Jazakumullah khairan, and I'll see you later. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? Did I introduce? Was that the right to do it? You're trying to copy the chat. Yeah, I'm not. I'm this is, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a very, it's like a phony imitation. Is it? It's not the level, you so know. How, so how do I, how do I imitate you? Yeah, this is actually an impossible mission. Is it? Yes, because we're talking about two different caliber. I think you should start imitating me then. <laughs> <laughs> That'll put all of us in trouble. <laughs> if I do that, we'll get no donations, that's all. Why, why, why? <laughs> so, uh, look, I mean, I, I love the fact that, you know, um, you guys are actually doing things in English language. You're doing things now, you've got people doing things in Arabic language, you've got things in Norwegian language, you're moving around. A Scandinavia now is... Everywhere I go, honestly, I'm not just saying this in front of the camera, wallahi. Everywhere I go, people know what we're doing here. Alhamdulillah. Everywhere I go, everywhere. In Oslo, oh, you guys have had Islam net, the center, this and that, this. Everyone knows what's going on here. And the reason why is because it's really hit home. Wallahi, I was just speaking to some guys, yeah? Yeah. In the Aqsum Billah. It's a true story. Yeah. And they were telling me that, you know, what you guys done with that Quran by the last year, it changed the game completely, bro. It changed the game. It's the Muslim civil rights initiative. And I love the fact that you guys are doing that. And especially now with the Palestine cause, everyone's in great solidarity. And so I just want to say that we can see also those elements yeah. who are, I would say, let's say antithetical to our cause, opposed to us and anti us, that they are starting to get jealous and envious. Yes. 
Um, Tell us more about that because you've been you've been observing those people, haven't you? So you have people, you know, the, the the Zionist movement and their and their allies mm -hmm. they're trying to make issues. They're trying to even you know, we, we we received some terror threats as well. And you went to the police, and the police didn't yeah, care. Yeah, it, you know, it's it's quite shocking. It's quite disturbing. It's very disturbing, bro. So, but I, I mean, as you guys just saw the event, Alhamdulillah, and it was packed. Hundreds, hundreds of Muslims are coming and they're actually you know, learning about the religion and they're coming closer to Allah and they are waking up. And yes, sir. That's, that's the big thing. This is an yes, awakening. Sir. Yes. We are awakening the Muslim Ummah mm -hmm. and that needs to be done, especially in these kinds of circumstances we're finding the Ummah today. Absolutely. It, is a, it has to be an organized effort and you know what i think people are convinced now because they've seen yeah. they've seen what it is this is where there's an electric environment bro there's a vibe everywhere i go in norway this place like everyone knows what this movement is about yeah. and so it's time to give charity it's time to give charity into an investment that's going to help you in this dunya and the akhirah you know and that's what allah calls us a goodly loan but also i was just thinking about this ayah subhanallah an amazing ayah but it shows you the importance of charity and sadaqah in islam that when someone and when death comes upon them, Surah Al-Munafiqoon of all surahs, chapter 63, he's going to say what? لَوْلَا أَخَّرْتَنِي إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ قَرِيبٍ فَأَصَّدَّقَ وَأَكُمْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ If only you had just let me for some time. So this person's in regret now. Yeah. And the Qur'an's mentioned this, that he would say, فَأَصَّدَّقَ وَأَكُمْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ That I would have given money, a صَدَّقْ I would have given charity, subhanAllah. Now you have the opportunity to give charity to one of, if not the, one of the most important, biggest centers in the world. In the whole world, in the Dawah world, which is Islam net, because it can do and say things, which by the way, people can't do and say things in, like this in the Muslim world, censorship, this and that, governments, all those kind of things. This is one of the most fruitful opportunities of charity in the entire world, dunya. All they have to do is click the link below, and I think they will do that, bro. I think they will. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.